Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In 1981 and 2007, Israel acted alone against Arab nuclear efforts. The strikes at the Iraqi and Syrian reactors were undertaken out of the blue, and their limited nature helped convince Saddam Hussein and Bashar al-Assad to abstain from retaliation. This is not expected to be the case if Israel decides to send its air force to take out the Iranian nuclear infrastructure. War is certain to ensue and spread to the Israeli rear, as well as to Gulf countries allied with the West. So if the task is beyond Israel's means, can it trust friendly countries, headed by the United States of course, to help it defend against the Iranian response? To discuss it, we're joined from central Israel by Ambassador Dania Yalon, who is co-host to TV7 Middle East Review, Powers in Play co-panelist, Israel's former ambassador to the United States and the former Israeli deputy foreign minister. Thank you for joining us, sir. My pleasure, John. Also joining us elsewhere here in Jerusalem is Mr. Robert Silverman, who is a lecturer at Shalem College and former president of the American Foreign Service Association. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. And with us in the studio is our TV7 editor at large and host of Watchmen Talk, Powers in Play, and so much more, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader understanding uh, regarding this current topic. And I'd like to ask you particularly, as today we're going to ask a question, can Israel rely on the West vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, the short answer is no, but we don't want it to be the shortest program ever. Right. So um, uh, we will convert it to up to a point or from a certain point on. Um, obviously, uh, right now, and things uh, may change over time, uh, neither the Biden administration uh, nor the European governments, who happen uh, to, uh, to be uh, a bit stronger now than the Americans in their uh, view of uh, Iran's shenanigans uh, on the nuclear issue, none of them uh, is going to help Israel conduct a strike against uh, the Iranian nuclear infrastructure. And uh, you didn't ask about uh, the international organizations, but as we know, Director General Grossi of the IAEA um, came out with a statement uh, saying that any strike at, any military strike at um, a reactor, a facility, uh, would be contrary to international law. Now, what happens um, once Israel does take action unilaterally and Iran retaliates? Would the United States uh, at that time uh, see itself committed to help defend the Israeli population against missile strikes according to all the protocols uh, signed and um, practiced between uh, the uh, Israeli Navy and Air Force and the Sixth Fleet and other elements? Well, right now, one should not bet on it if in the councils of war, Israel deliberates whether to go or not go. Of course, uh, we always need to take into account, uh, particularly the United States, uh, considering the fact that uh, it has the five points of, uh, basically they called it the five uh, points of carry, but uh, that's, uh, or a Carter, excuse me, uh, which uh, are the points which ultimately push it uh, into that direction. But uh, regarding your uh, mention of IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi, I think it's also important to uh, highlight uh, uh, Chapter 7, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, which ultimately provides countries uh, the right to self-defense. And considering the fact that Israel and Iran are already at war and Iran attacked Israel repeatedly and proclaims its intentions to attack but, Israel. But, you know, pre preventive or preemptory self-defense um, is still debated among lawyers. Now, Israel will not uh, wait, of course, for, for any uh, uh, legal opinion, binding or not, uh, if it feels uh, that there is an existential threat. But following the action and what will obviously transpire in the UN Security Council, it might be in trouble. And we have plenty of good lawyers to back that up. Ambassador Ayalon, I'd like to uh, refer this to you. Uh, we hear circulating uh, statements uh, throughout uh, Israel's defense establishment and diplomatic corps, uh, raising concerns about Western def uh, backing, basically, of Israel in the event 
that uh, war breaks out between Israel, obviously, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, is this a true concern? Oh, absolutely. You know, this, um, I mean, you evoked, of course, the two uh, relevant examples of 81 and of 2007. Uh, by the way, at which uh, at that time also uh, there was no uh, support in the international community for uh, Israel's self defense uh, action. But what we call today, I guess, uh, the, the pagan doctrine, which will not allow uh, any uh, adversary of, the, of Israel in the region, in the uh, Middle East, uh, to develop and uh, possess uh, uh, nuclear weapons, I think this still ensues and, uh, and very strongly, whether we get support or not. Of course, uh, uh, Israel would very much uh, like to, uh, to have uh, uh, allies here that would actively uh, help it. And we uh, would love to, to go uh, together with, with others, but if we cannot get allies uh, and if we must act, we will uh, act alone. It's not going to be easy. Uh, it's uh, going to be maybe even rough. But I think, um, you know, among all the choices that Israel has, at the end of the day, uh, when push comes to shove, the question will not be, are we going to get support from anybody? The question will be, are we doing it or not? And I believe that any responsible government in Israel will um, consider and decide, yes, we have to do what we have to do, just as we did previously. Mr. Silverman, I'd like to uh, hear your take on this from the American perspective, obviously, as an American diplomat for many, many years. When the U.S. State Department comes out and reiterates time and again uh, the, the statements from coming out of the White House that the United States uh, stands firm in its commitment to Israel's security and that it will not allow Iran to obtain nuclear weapons. Of course, initially it was, uh, it won't allow Iran to become a nuclear threshold state and then it turned into uh, not uh, allow it to obtain nuclear weapons and now it's not allow it to uh, uh, field nuclear weapons. Uh, where does it stop? Thank you, Jonathan. Well, as you noted, uh, the Biden administration has continued the same uh, public lines of reassuring Israel and, and other countries, including those in the Gulf that are threatened by Iran, uh, saying things like um, that it won't allow uh, Iran to become a nuclear threshold state or to develop a nuclear bomb. Uh, and those were reiterated most recently on March 6th and 7th uh, during the U.S.-Israel Strategic Consultative Group with um, the uh, National Security Advisors of Israel and the U.S. So uh, the public line is there. I, I would add that Blinken has also said, the Secretary of State, that uh, they prefer dip uh, diplomacy. Diplomacy is the most effective uh, way to deal with the Iran nuclear files. So um, both that, uh, the standard talking point and the diplomacy uh, is the preferred option points are out there. I, I would just note in general the famous saying of Winston Churchill that the U.S. always does the right thing, but only after exhausting all other options. Uh, so uh, would it, uh, and we also note, of course, that the most effective way to uh, of a military strike on Iran, which is a very different uh, proposition, frankly, than either the 1981 Iraq strike or the 2007 Syria strike, uh, the most effective option would be a U.S. Uh, one because the U.S. has uh, unique uh, military capacities. For instance, the huge, um, what they call the massive ordnance penetrator bomb that would go right down through the, uh, the mountain uh, of Natanz. So, the only, and only the U.S. has that particular form of uh, smart bomb. Israel doesn't have it, doesn't even have the capacity to, um, to bring it to Iran. So uh, the U.S. would be the preferred military strike option, and uh, the way you would get the U.S. to do that is um, Israel could help itself. And I just wanted to say three things that I think Israel could do to help realize that option. The first Briefly, is, is uh, to uh, really show that Israel does have its unique uh, unilateral option, because if Israel is threatening to use its own unilateral option, that encourages the U.S. to get more involved, because uh, the, Israel does, the U.S. does not want to be brought into a regional war. Uh, 
and uh, would prefer to do this uh, sort of uh, strategic um, option where it takes out the nuclear facilities, but it would only really be encouraged to do that if Israel is threatening, as it did in 2010 and 2012, to, to do it on its own. So Israel has to develop its own unilateral strike capacity, and there are some indications that Israel hasn't really invested in that option as much as it could have. For instance, it hasn't it, it delayed uh, ordering air refueling tankers that would be really an uh, important aspect of uh, Israeli uh, Air Force reaching Natanz and coming back. Uh, they will have to do air refueling even with their expanded fuel tank uh, that their F-16s have. So um, they delayed until the very end of the Trump administration and even ordering from the U.S. air refueling tankers. So that they could help themselves by investing more uh, of their military budget in, in that option. Second, uh, if, if this is indeed Israel's priority, then why are we uh, focused on a, um, judicial, a domestic legislation that is very divisive? Uh, if Israel wants the world, and particularly the U.S., uh, to work with it on an Iran option, it shouldn't be uh, dividing itself and its uh, itself from other allies through a very controversial set of domestic uh, legislation as its first step of this new government. So that was a misstep, if, if Iran really is indeed the priority. And the third thing I would say is if you want the West, and particularly the U.S., to help on the main threat to Israel, which is Iran, then why not also help uh, Israel's uh, Western allies in Europe on the Russia threat? Israel has not really supplied Ukraine with any form of a weaponry, even though uh, air defense weaponry, defensive weaponry, the kind of things Ukraine has wanted. So Israel could, the third step Israel could do to help itself on the Iran file would be to show support for other countries' uh, um, strategic threats, for instance, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Those are my th three thoughts on that. Indeed. Well, Mr. Owen, I'd like to hear you, uh, your points on these, but... Uh there were a few war game um, scenarios being played out by various uh, uh, institutes of, of think tanks, uh, so to speak, including the CSIS and the leading ones in the world, uh, which ultimately came down to the same conclusion. Without U.S. Um, consent, Israel will not strike Iran because it will then have uh, a complex scenario where it will need to drag its allies rather than receive its uh, backing willingly at a time when also Western uh, weapons cachets are depleted uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, when we really look at the big picture, there are changing camps in the world. We do see strategic competition play a role here. Iran is clearly on the side of Russia. It's clearly on the side of China. Israel is clearly on the side of the United States. Of course, Israel does have uh, commercial dealings with China. It has uh, uh, careful relations with Russia at this stage, but it has no choice. And, of course, we can always refer to the fact that the United States has relations with China, regardless of its uh, rhetoric on the matter. To what degree does this actually indicate that a credible military threat is not necessarily on the table? So let's leave the Chinese dimension uh, aside for a moment, uh, even though um, when the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley was here, and when General Austin came over, the Pentagon uh, mentioned that um, it is quite worry of uh, Israel's relations with China, because uh, even though they are commercial in nature, there is also and always um, a strategic aspect to whatever the uh, Chinese Communist Party and uh, its various offshoots do. But let's leave China uh, out of this uh, consideration uh, for a while. Going back some 55 years to the American decision to supply Israel with the F-4 Phantom, which was the state-of-the-art fighter plane, fighter bomber plane of the time, the concept in Washington was that Israel does have a sincere concern 
sometimes existential, and that the United States does not want it to feel that it has its back to the world. And therefore, rather than go to some unconventional option, better that Israel feel secure by having conventional arms and American support. This is in very general, broad terms. But when you come to a concrete crisis, a concrete scenario, it doesn't mean and it doesn't commit the uh, incumbent administration to do anything in particular. And then Israel is left um, to decide on its own whether to employ certain weapons, because most of its weapons are U.S. supplied. Is the U.S. going to refurbish uh, munitions if Israel uh, expands them in a conflict? It's not going to be a one-shot operation. What happens down the road? We saw that the United States itself has depleted its uh, stocks. Uh, how is it going uh, to, uh, to replenish Israel's uh, stocks? And what will happen in the United Nations if uh, there are calls uh, um, regarding uh, censor uh, sanctions and, and so on? So Israel has to take account of the American position regardless of what happens in Tehran. Indeed. Ambassador uh, Ayalon, I'd, I'd like to hear your perspective as a long-time Israeli diplomat, also, uh, of course, you were the chief policy advisor to prime ministers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, when you see a delegation uh, flying to the United States, of course, the Minister of Strategic Affairs, Ron Dermer, was there, the former ambassador uh, to the United States as well, um, including the National Security Advisor, uh, Tzachy Negbi, who was also previously a minister, meeting, as uh, uh, Mr. Silverman noted, uh, with uh, uh, O'Sullivan. Uh, there, there are a lot of those kind of meetings, but it's all on a strategic security level. Diplomacy between Israel and the United States is predominantly focused on the Palestinian arena. Does it mean that when we're talking about the diplomatic channel, it's not as it used to be in the past that uh, relations between uh, the, the state of Israel and, Israel and the United States, excuse me, were truly intact when we're talking about the flow of information on both sides, also on the Iranian issue? Well, Jonathan, I, I have participated in many, or and I have headed some of the what we um, used to call the strategic dialogue between Israel and the United States, which was... Uh, a multi-functionary and it was uh, interdisciplinary and uh, um, interagency from the United States. Uh, you could, uh, and I believe this time as well, the same State Department and the Pentagon and uh, Ministry of uh, Energy and of course, um, you know, the, the, the different military, CIA, DIA and others. And from Israel also, you know, the counterparts. And um, it wasn't only the Palestinians that, uh, where uh, what was discussed, it was uh, it started usually, uh, and I would say traditionally, and probably as well uh, continuing now, is the regional uh, situation in terms of stability, and then you drill down on different um, you know, specific areas in uh, in the region. Uh, Iran always uh, in the past uh, you know two decades loomed very large in these uh, discussions. And yes, also the Palestinians. But uh, in this uh, type of dialogues, of course, no um, operative uh, measures were discussed, naturally. It was only guidelines and broad strategic overview. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, with, uh, with the results or one of the products of this uh, um, strategic um, uh, dialogue, was to bring to the decision makers, both in Washington and the, uh, and of course in, in Jerusalem, uh, the, the outlook uh, without necessarily making any specific recommendations. Uh, this uh, would be uh, done, I guess, in each capital with their own, um, you know, competitive, uh, I would say, uh, forums and, uh, and and consultants. And but at the end of the day, in every dialogue. What was very much uh, emphasized, Jonathan, was that Israel is sovereign to decide what is uh, important 
or critical uh, to its uh, um, national defense, to especially. Uh, and the codes are, are, are always very, very clear. When Israel see, says and states that it sees something, certainly Iran, as an existential threat, the understanding in Washington also is that Israel will pull no stops if it needs to. Uh, better done, of course, with consultations uh, to the United States. I believe now things are even more complicated because uh, the United States and what they emphasize to us all the time is that they, uh, if, of course, any, uh, you know, uh, uh, war erupts between uh, Israel and Iran, uh, the United States and their soldiers will be uh, directly affected and, uh, and very, very uh, quickly. So they would love or would like, uh, more than would like, to be uh, in the know and to be previously um, advised. And I believe this will be the case this time, certainly when Israel knows, you know, uh, we know that the first, uh, I mean, you would have a few, the way I see, you would have here a few phases. Let's say we, you know, push comes to an end and we have to strike, whether it's with or without uh, uh, other uh, participants. First phase is the strike. Second uh, phase would be probably the response. And then the third uh, phase would be um, the counter to the response. And for that, we very much need the United States in re replenishing uh, munitions, weapons, and of course, a political uh, uh, umbrella in international uh, relations. And maybe at the end of the day, of course, also some uh, uh, actions, uh, military actions on the ground. Mr. Silverman, what do you regard currently as the strategic interests of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and Iran in particular? Well, the, the, and those interests haven't changed, uh, Jonathan. They, they remain, uh, you know, the free flow of oil to the world economy uh, from the region, and uh, which even though the U.S. is no longer itself directly importing as much oil from the Saudi Arabia as it used to, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy is affected by world prices for oil. So uh, the, the single biggest interest uh, would be that uh, stability and the flow of oil. The a second one would, of course, be um, counterterrorism, you know, to prevent uh, terrorist groups as Al Qaeda, the ISIS uh, developing um, um, their capacities. And the third is the support for Israel as the only democracy in the region. So those interests are longstanding and haven't changed, uh, despite uh, this idea that it may be a lesser um, priority than it used to be because of the other priorities that are emerging in, in uh, China and Russia, managing the relationship with China, uh, deterring Russia from <laughs> uh, and, and stopping its invasion of, of Russia, uh, of Ukraine to the extent that that's possible. Those are the two biggest issues. So the Middle East has receded in its priority a bit, but the interests are still there. And if, as, uh, as Danny said, if, if, uh, if Israel gets uh, into a war with Iran, the U.S. Uh, would be there. And to your question, uh, or to Amir's question, would, would the U.S. replenish stockpiles? Of course, it has always done so, whether it was the Yom Kippur War or more recently, um, uh, a bipartisan uh, group in Congress agreed to provide uh, replenishment of Israel's uh, missiles after the latest round of uh, uh, fighting with uh, Hamas. So yes, I, we can expect the U.S. to be there. But like I said, Israel can help itself in this relationship with the U.S. Uh, by um, doing the right things itself. And uh, I just want to reiterate that, you know, engaging in uh, as a first measure in this uh, very controversial and divisive um, divisive both internally within Israel and divisive of its relationship of its alliances, uh, this domestic legislation is not helpful on the Iran file. Um, mm. You know, uh, may, maybe that should be put off to down the road if Iran really is uh, the, the strategic threat that, uh, that it appears to be. Mr. Well, you know, in, in four months or so, we will mark the 50th anniversary of Joe Biden's first trip to the region, including to Jerusalem, where he met with um, Prime Minister Golda Meir. This was before the Yom Kippur War, a few weeks before uh, the war. And by the way, he came over from Cairo, where 
they dismissed this um, 30 year old junior senator uh, yeah. and did not did not uh, have him meet with Sadat or any other uh, senior official. So, so you so, think he holds grudges? No, he doesn't hold grudges. <laughs> uh, he's a very lovable, likable uh, person, uh, glad handing uh, everybody. But um, Joe Biden is sober enough and realistic enough to know that he is not going to fix the region's problems in uh, the uh, less than two years that he has. So, so let me interject as we have roughly one minute for this. To what degree does public opinion in the United States going to dictate American policy on whatever is going to emerge in the near future? The 2024 presidential and congressional elections, of course, are going to uh, be a factor, but also in Iran. The Iranians are playing a cat and mouse game, and they are probably going to see whether Biden has a real chance to be reelected. If they believe that he is going to be there in 2025, they may revive the JCPOA, which right now is not on the agenda. So they're going to stop lying to the agency. They are going uh, to uh, lie a little less. Interesting. Well, uh, time will tell whether that's true or not. Uh, of course, they have done so for three years now. They have another three years to go, uh, potentially. Um, but uh, hopefully we won't have three years to discuss this uh, topic and it will be behind us. Um, I'd like to thank Ambassador Daniel Alon, Mr. Robert Silverman, and Mr. Amir Oren, of course. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. And until next time, shalom. <laughs>